I think we should begin now. Am I audible? Am I visible? Hi, Faye, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let's begin. Uh, a very warm welcome to each one of you. Reading is more fun when you know how. And once you learn to read, you will be free forever. Good evening and very warm welcome to, for today's webinar. My name is Shifali Juneja and I will be the moderator for the session today. We are all excited to have you here in the webinar again today. Let me share a few norms of the session. We'll put everyone on mute except for our speakers to avoid any disruption. Do not use the chat box for any greetings or introductions. We'll have a 10 minute square Q&A session at the end of the session during the speak during which the speaker will address all of your questions. This session is also live on YouTube before, uh, for those of you who, who will not be able to join in the end. Uh, I would like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to extend, extend a warm welcome to the presenters, Faye Berryman and Nick Berryman for today's session. About Faye Berryman. In 1965, Faye began her teaching career as a secondary school English teacher. In 1976, she founded Fitzroy Community School with Philip O'Carroll. We began developing the Fitzroy Readers Program while working with the children in the classroom in order to discover how they most effectively learn to read and write English. The systematic synthetic phonics method of the Fitzroy Readers is the result of this work, which has been refrained and perfected in the classroom over many years. Faye's work in literacy was recognized by the Australian government in 2020, where she was honored on Australian Day with the award of Member of the Order of Australia. Congratulations, Faye. Now, a little bit more, a little bit about Nick Merriben too. He was one of the original students at Fitzroy Community School, learning with the Fitzroy readers as they were developed. After graduating from high school, Nick completed a combined Bachelor's of Art and Laws at the Melbourne University before practicing law for the two years. Nick moved to Taiwan to be with his wife, Amy, where he taught English for seven years. He taught all levels from kindergarten to adult, though primarily with younger students. He introduced these students, the phonics teaching and the Fitzroy readers, and they had great success with their English studies. Returning to Australia in 2007, Nick completed a graduate diploma in education. He has taught alongside Faye at Fitzroy Community School since this time. Nick also completed a Master's of Applied Positive Psychology and in, incorporates into, into the teaching of literature to a strength-based focus. Let's begin with the session right away and turn the floor over to our speakers. Thank you so much. Well, good evening, everybody. Well, it's good evening in Australia, and we're very happy to be here with you this evening. Um, we're just going to share our screen so that we can bring you all up here with what we're going to do. Can, can you guys see? Can everyone see the screen okay? Yeah, yeah can, it's, it's yeah. visible. We can see a screen. Let's go to the full screen, Amy. So you can just uh, press, uh, click on the button play. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the very warm introduction. We're very happy to be here. We're beginning to feel we're getting to know you quite well. And I believe some people have or have been to our earlier presentations this year. Tonight, um, we're going to again look at phonics. Uh, phonics is the decoding method, which we'll talk about a little bit more, or, or quite a lot more, actually. And we're going to look at how the Fitzroy word skills and the Fitzroy readers work together in partnership. And we're going to be looking at the progression of the system. Tonight, we'll be specifically looking at readers um, nine and word schools that accompany them and also 19. So you can see the development and tomorrow night we'll go further. And then in the fortnight, we'll concentrate on our writing sessions there. So phonics teaching, the 
is not true phonics unless it's taught systematically. A lot of programs say they teach phonics, but they add, do it in a sort of ad hoc basis and the children are not getting that grounding right from the start where that is their basic approach. So we stress this, it has to be taught systematically and the Fitzroy method is a true phonic method. It is That is the core of its delivery. This is a very important um, page on, on the screen now. I'll go through that fairly slowly. Obviously, when we speak, we make sounds. Sounds come out of our mouth. And children learn to speak long, long before they learn to write. And in fact, in, in, the, in well, earlier days, only the educated few learned to write. So obviously, um, hearing sounds comes before writing sounds. English has an alphabet of 26 letters, which we know, and that's 26 written symbols. Now, if you've got tiny children, you can talk about them as shapes rather than symbols, 26 shapes. And when we write English, we use these shapes, these letters so-called, to write down the, 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 um, the sounds we speak. In fact, if you have little wee children, you can say, we're putting our talking sounds onto the page. That's how I talk about it. We're putting our talking sounds onto the page. So, of course, we need to know what sounds. So, in English, the, the strange thing is we have 44 spoken sounds, 44, but we only have 26 letters. And this is where we bring in the diagraphs, we'll, we'll, which we'll talk to you about. Sometimes, of course, we use just one letter to write a sound, but sometimes we need two or even three just simply to make one of the sounds of English speech. Learning to read is what is actually, you could say, learning to decode, learning to decode. There's a lot of talk these days about um, decoding readers or non-decodable read decodable readers, non-decodable readers. So um, learning to read means learning to decode the text, which are, which are the sounds that we speak. Learning to write means learning which letters to write for the sounds we speak. And of course, in English, we write from left to right, which is simply an arbitrary decision. So what we're going to look at is decodable and non-decodable texts. And we're doing this through a comparison of stories for children. When children are growing up, hopefully they're having lots of stories read to them. And one of the classic fairy tales is the three little pigs. And in that, we'll just give you an example of the words. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs whose mother decided they should go out into the world to seek their fortune. Just be sure to build your houses the first before the first frost comes, she warned, and mind your manners. Now, children at the age that they're accessing this, they can't read it. They are just hearing it. It's non-decodable. They have they don't have the strategies in place or the knowledge to read this. So this is not a reader, this is just a story. However, the text we give them are ones that they can read, that they can decode. We give them the knowledge they need and then they're able to access the text themselves. So the reader, a big pig, when the children are reading, they're going, they're able to sound it out. A, big, 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 pig, itten, in, a, wig, wig, did, a, jig, jig. A big pig in a wig did a jig. For the children, that is success. They are able to read it by themselves by decoding or using the sounds. And what this shows is that any true phonic system is actually a decodable system. We are just learning how to access English through the rules of the language. And later on, we'll show you how that works even at a, at a higher level. This, this was um, reader two, book two of the Fitzroy um, reading method. So, just reiterating here what Nick has said, decodable readers are those the children can read themselves according to the sounds, that's the letters and digraphs that they have learnt. De and 
This is an important statement. Decodable readers are crucial. Children can hear and see that words are sounds put together. So we've got a pig, it's a pig. We've got a cat, cat. So they can, they can see that words are sounds put together. That's very important. Words are sounds put together. We hear a lot about the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E. But for example, if a cat came into the room, you would never say um, a C-A-T has come into the room. You'd say a cat has come into the room. So children need to understand that words are the sounds of the alphabet put together, the, word, the sounds of the alphabet put together. Now, point two here is non-decodable texts often cause children to panic. They cannot see a rhyme or reason. For example, if you just pass them that lovely storybook, The Three Pigs, they would look at that and they couldn't make any sense of it. And sometimes children panic if they, they can't see a logic. And that's, what, that's why we are saying that decodable texts are crucial. So a question that's often asked is what age to begin? Now, I, I lived in Taiwan for many years, and I love to use these with the kindergarten students there. And we'd play a lot of games with the alphabet and sounds. And over time, the songs we used to sing have been developed into the Fitzroy sounds, which gives the children a little booklet for each letter. So when they're learning A, they get at for apple, at for apple, at for apple, at, 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 with a number of other words. And we also have the Fitzroy alphabet book. Alphabet book does require writing, so the children do have to have the requisite fine motor skills. So readiness is really the big factor. Are children mature enough at the, at the developmental stage where they can access this? And with young kids, there's actually a big variation in their comprehension and particularly writing readiness. Mm -hmm. So that is one where I found it was very accessible for kindergarten children from three to four. We started doing the letters and at four, we were definitely writing them. And the aim was to have them really comfortable with the alphabet by the time they were starting primary school. Hmm. A, a wonderful thing. And I think it's in the, um, it, it, it is in the teacher's guide, the, uh, good ears games where we we play games. What word am I saying? Dog or pig or hurtin or foot so that they they get to know, as I said before, that the words are the sounds put together. Another game you can play is I spy, where you say I spy with my lie something beginning with, and then you give them the sound like t. And they look around and they say, oh, table. You go, yes, to, for table. So they're reinforcing the knowledge they need. So reader one in our series requires only knowledge of 13 basic sounds, the letters there on the right. Once the children know those basic sounds, they are able to read the reader for themselves. They don't need to have the whole alphabet. And the aim with that for the aim for us with this is to have the children reading as quickly as possible. Children go to school, they want to read. That's what they're there to learn. So the longer it's put off, the more demoralized some kids can feel. They feel it's something that's un inaccessible to them. So we have them 13 letters. We teach them those basic sounds, and then they're able to read the first reader. And we progressively add just a few letters on for each subsequent reader. The, the reader we showed you uh, had four, had 17 sounds, and we're very similar. I'm, I see if I can go back to that for just a sec without too much. Ah, yes. So you can see see the simplicity here. A big, a big pig in a wig did a jig. Whereas by the time you get to our final book, book 60, the text is actually quite challenging. I'll, do, I'll read this to you. As Nicholas's name was called, he rose nervously, yet almost defiantly. He was determined to make his speech a good one. He owed it to his grandfather, who had given him so much. Pa had died two years earlier, but Pa's words remained echoing in Nicholas's memory. 
He now understood that they were words of wisdom. Nicholas knew that these words would remain with him in his heart to inspire him and give him courage throughout his life. Now, in this particular book, we are looking at CH coming in with Greek words, CH Normally, we think of CH as making a ch sound, but here, coming in from the Greek, English is full of words coming in from different languages. Um, the, the CH comes in from Greek and it makes a k sound, as in cat. But you can see the progression of the text from very simply a big pig now to what we have reader, reader 60. And of course, once you can read at that standard, you can actually read anything. So <laughs> our method is always the same. We love to the children to feel really secure and know what's coming ahead. So I've got a class. I said, next week, what are we doing? And they said, oh, and they can tell me. They'll do the A and B sheets. The A and B sheets give the children the knowledge they need to read the reader for themselves. So we work on them together as a class, give them the knowledge, and then they'll read the reader to me. That's step two. We read the reader. Again, when we're doing it, we're really focusing on the sounds, the rules, that the rule that's being learned. Once they've done that, we do the comprehension while the story is really fresh in their mind. And then we go and complete the other remaining word skills sheets. And what we're going to do is take you through two different readers and our approach would do with reader nine and reader 19 to show two readers and also how it's progressed over that time. Now, Nick said it makes the children feel secure. I'd like to add that it actually makes the teachers feel secure because the method remains the same. Once you've taught reader one, you can probably teach reader 60, and we will show you how the method does remain the same with, as Nick said, sheets A and B. So once you get used to the method, it, it is a very simple one to use, teacher-friendly and student-friendly. Reiterating a little bit, phonics is a Greek word. The PH, of course, is again another word coming to English from the, the Greek language. So phonic means sound. Phonic systems use the alphabet. Whatever um, country you're in, the uh, Arabic language as are phonic and Czechoslovakians, phonic, many languages are phonic. So any language that uses an alphabet is a phonic language. Each letter of the alphabet stands for a particular sound speech. So what we'd like you to take away tonight is that the alphabet is a sound code. It's a sound code. And it's this sound code of basic sounds and digraphs that enable us to decode English text. So English has 26 written symbols, 44 spoken sounds. And as we're asking what is the solution, but we've already told you it's combining them together into digraphs, or I guess if it has three letters, we could call it a trigraph. For convenience, we just use the term digraph to mean two or more letters which form a different sound. And these sounds are different from the basic sound of single letters. Mm -hmm. There are about 60 common digraphs. You can see examples at the bottom, AR put together says R, CH says CH, or in less common cases can say K, words like chaos or chasm. EW says U, AWL says all, TION says SHIN, and we also learn the variation SION there. So we're learning these 60 common digraphs, we're learning the basic letter sounds, and we learn also the really common special words or sight words which can't be sounded out. And that's actually quite a finite amount of knowledge that enables the children to access 95% or more of the English language. Last time I was online, one of the questions I think I didn't quite understand, and I, thinking about it later, I apologise to whoever was the question, was asking the question. It was actually about the digraphs. Now, th this can be quite, if English is not your first language, this can be quite a challenge to think about. Like we think of a letter like A making a sound A, ah, and that if you think of that as one block, 
then you can have to think of AR, which is two letters, but it's actually just one block. It's only making one sound, R. So CH, they're all just making one new sound to make up the shortfall that we have, because remember we have uh, we have 26 letters, single letters, but we have 44 sounds. And when we play the good ears game, the children, like if we're doing a word like fish, we say f i sh. They're saying it's three sounds, f i sh. It's only three sounds, even though it has four letters. So we're getting them to think, okay, we know how to write it, but when we're thinking of the sounds, the sh is just sh. And sometimes you can put your fingers up like that. The f, i, and sh together like that. So three sounds. So digraphs are not blends. Blends are when we put letters and we put them close together. So if we've got a word like splash, the spl, spl, that's a blend. The sh is a sh. That's a digraph. Again, sp in spoon, sp. And I often get the children to start out so going sp. P, sp, 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 and we get them together, but they're realizing that it's not a new sound. But when we've got digraphs, they are new information. It's an entirely new sound. So when you get the two O's, it's not O and O, two O's are U. Oh. And also, because we always teach in that order, U first, and then we have a subsequent reader where two O's make the sound U, like in book or look. O A is not O and A, it's a new sound. It's O. So if we're reading a word like boat, we read it as B O T. And if we're playing good ears games or number ears, we're saying, oh, look, that's three. B O T, three sounds. But how do we write the O? Ah, that's O A. So often asking him, how do you write that sound? When we're talking about phonics, we're talking about sounds, sounding words. So sounding words are words that sound out according to phonic rules. Uh, sometimes they, they are sounded out using basic sounds like the word cat, 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 cat. But sometimes they're basic sounds and digraphs. So have a look at the word fork there on the screen. It's a, a single f, then it's got or. And then it's got k. So three sounds, but four letters. So really what we're saying is like three blocks. The OR could be considered just like one alphabet letter. Or sometimes we just use digraphs like um, uh, each. Each, each, each of you or arch and arch. So phonics really should make language easy. Reading larger words like g o b l e n s goblins, w o m b at wombat, and the complex words where we're combining both basic sounds and the digraphs tr a n s p o r t transport, m u n l i t moonlight. So we're giving the children the knowledge they need to sound out these words or decode them. Mm. And this is really what decodable readers are all about. So moving on, when we do the word skills, we always start with the A page, the A sheet. And when there's a digraph, that is the rule that's focused on. So as you can see on this page, we have the OO, O as in roof. And when we're talking to the children about this, we call it cooking with letters. We give them the example that if you're learning if you're cooking a cake, you might get milk and your eggs and flour. We ask the children what goes in. They often like to put chocolate in or chocolate chips. But we, we work out what goes in a cake and you mix it up and you cook it. You put it in the oven and bake it and you take it out. Now, you don't really have milk and eggs and flour anymore. You have a cake. It's a new thing that's being created. And the same thing we tell them happens with letters. When we get our O and our O, but we put them together, we mix them all up put in the oven, bake it, out comes an oo. And we're giving them, this is a new sound. We can't think of it as the separate things. Together, this block, this oo is oo. So we say oo making the sound oo as in roof. And the A page will give them lots of practice with that new rule. You can see there that they're joining the, the picture to its sound. So 
we have them sound out root oof roof and find the roof root oof room find the room food the food pool and and then there's a little exercise just using information that they've had from earlier re, uh, reading books. now because this is the first actual diagraph they learn we and we've got, got them used to the alphabet by reading a story with each letter so when they're learning T, we might read them 10 uh right them the tiger who came to tea if it's at, for apple we read 10 apples a, a, apples up on top and we love to bring stories into the class as much as we can so we have this book room on the broom which is quite a well-known children's book and we'll use that one just for this diagraph to show them that diagraphs can also be in books and they get to listen to the sound of the oo making room on the broom and all of our teaching is about making it feel real to the children so this is a book that they have often loved hearing and here they now know how to read and write the words in that book. And you can say to them, goodness me, if you didn't have an oo sound, you couldn't have that wonderful book. The reader 19, or here the word skill sheet 19A, is practicing the diagraph AR, making the sound R as in mark, mark. And again, we're having the children read a whole lot of words, ah, ka, de, ark, dark, and join them to their pictures. And all of these words are giving them practice of the diagraph, which we will have introduced using our idea of cooking with letters and creating a new sound by combining letters together. Hmm. So just reiterating, you can see what we're showing you that the A sheets, I'll go here, are teaching you the new diagraph, the, which we call the new sound. There you go. So they're, they're the A sheets. Now, on, on each reader, we also give this knowledge. It's inside the reader, inside the cover, and also on the back cover, so they can see it twice, depending on where they look. Looking at the back cover here, you can see the new sound is oo as in roof, and we also have some special words. The special words are words that the children will never be able to sound out, or as in the examples here, words that they haven't yet learnt the rules for. So name has A, another letter E, the E making the A say A. And we'll tell the children the rule, but we'll say, this is something that you need to know, but we'll have a reader that practices that soon. Again, we have the reader 19, AR making the sound R as in Rs. And we have some special words. And a few of the really important question words like what and when. Hmm. And there, if you look at what, the children are never going to be able to sound that one out. It is truly a special word. Space, on the other hand, has A, another letter E. And also when you have C followed by E, I, or Y, it says S, knowledge that they don't yet have. Hmm. So once again, you can see oh, the that the reader, the method remains the same. I was just going to say something about what we call the special words. They are words that haven't appeared in an earlier reader. So each reader builds on the one before, and any new information is that little bit on the back. This is why we're saying it's very teacher friendly because you know anything you've taught before will be repeated and revised in a book but this is the new information this is all the new information that you need so of course we have the phonic rule up the top and the special words at the bottom the special words are what we practice in the b sheet and here we yes here we are so on 9b i went bed two is a special word it's one of the ones we've learned earlier my mum practicing the word my and we'll often with the children at this stage still sound it out m i my m a mum m no they need to know the special word said and said was the special word in reader h and so we're building we're revising what we've done in one book earlier and then if we look at 19b there we have the ready when space park we have the words in the box up the top that the children have to put into sentences and all of this is always designed to give them as much practice as we can on the special words. 
Again, we'll always talk to them about any rules that they're going to come across, but this is knowledge they need, just single words for this particular reader. Hmm. And so by doing the A sheets and the B sheets first, when they come to the, the reading book, they can read it with more fluency. If you haven't done that, sometimes children struggle. But if you've carefully prepared the A and the B sheets, they come to the book with that the knowledge that they're going to need. So once they've done the A sheet and the B sheet, the children should be ready to read the readers. In class, the teacher doesn't read the reader to the children. The children read the reader to the teacher. So uh, you can see here at the start of story nine, we have letters to know because we teach capitals on a need to know basis. By the end of the first set, the children have all the capitals, but these are the ones they really need to focus on. And then we have words we can read. Now, the benefit of teaching capitals on a need to know basis is children are always thinking about when you get a capital. You start a name with capitals, you start a sentence with capitals. Otherwise, it's lowercase. And as you can see from all the words here, most of the letters children see are in fact lowercase. The words we can read will give us the practice of words, often special words or other rules that we've learned that they have seen before. So it's giving them extra revision. And this page is actually great. If you look at 19, children who are faster on the A and B sheets, I often use these pages. Say, so, okay, you've got the reader. We're going to read in a sec, but I want you to look at the words we know page and find all the different phonic rules you can. So then when the other students are ready, we look at this page and hopefully the students can give us all the rules like keep two E, say E. And we hope, you know, through practicing this constantly again and again, the children are becoming really familiar with all these phonic rules. On the left-hand side, we have a page, page nine it is, from our reader at number nine. And you can see there, we're, we're learning the two O's make an um, O sound. And you can see there that we've got the text the text uses the, the rule that we've learned. So you can see on the top line there, we have soon, su, u, n. Second line, we have ru, u, f, roof. And the bottom line, we have ru, u, n. So that's the phonic rule that we've learned for this book. So the text, the text um, consolidates the rule that we've learned, or you could put it this way, we've learned the rule so we can read the text. When we talk to the children up and say to them, why would we choose this word? And usually they get to the point where they go, ah, because that's the rule we're practicing and we needed to have a word with that in it. So on page, the next page there, you can see from reader 19 where the, we're practicing A-R saying ah, we've got park, dark, Mars, star, Mark, it's giving the children as much practice as we can with the phonic rule that they're learning. So it's reinforcing what we're doing always. And you can actually see the text progression. Obviously, the, the book nine is much simpler than the um, nine, is it nine, reader 19. 19 yeah. So just in 10 readers, you can see that they've actually progressed quite well with their reading ability. So after we do the readers, of course, we do the comprehension. And we always start off with subjects for discussion. For some children that who love ideas and sharing ideas, this can really get them engaged with what they're doing. Hmm. So um, that one, yes, what are roofs made of? And of course, roofs can be made of all sorts of different things. And so just getting the children to think beyond the text, because we don't want them to think that the only thing about that subject is that little book that they've read, but just getting them to put their, use their um, knowledge of the world to talk much more about the knowledge of the world. And you can see when we move on to 19, what are some of the other planets called? What are some things people need to take with them if they go into space? We're trying to get the children to really develop their language and their oral spoken skills and just their thinking processes. So for some kids who love space and the idea of travel, space travel astronauts, you know, they will really get engaged with this. The next activity is what's called a close exercise where children are learning a really important skill. That's scanning. 
we have so much information nowadays when they say maybe in you know, I think in a 10 year period, the amount of information we process every day has doubled. So children need the ability, adults need the ability to be able to scan texts quite quickly and find information. And so this closed exercise is filling in gaps. They have to be able to scan through the text and find the missing word, what the appropriate word for this gap. So clearly it's my name is Emma, but the children will have to find the page and find that sentence so they can put the information in. Hmm. So as I said, scanning is a very important skill. Once they've done that, we have them writing answers in Reader 9. We do this in the Word Skills book. So what is the name of the pup in this story? We'll always get the children to answer in a sentence. We want them to think about sentences right from the start. So the name of the pup in this story is Yap, or the pup in this story is called Yap. We give an oral answer that is a complete sentence, but they're just writing simple one or two word answers in the box there. By the next set, we have them writing in an exercise book and we expect them to write complete sentences. Who owned the car? Mark owned the car. And so we've developed from writing one or two word answers to complete sentences. But because we practiced orally giving sentence answers from the start, the children are quite comfortable with writing sentences. It's very important to talk about sentences. When you think about it, and I get my children to think about this, the greatest book ever written is simply one sentence followed by the next sentence followed by the next sentence. So it's if you've got all quality sentences, you have a quality book. And so it really is important to talk to the children about the importance of an interesting sentence. Now, this is an examples of some of the other sheets. So what we're trying to build onto is getting them really familiar with English grammar eventually, but often just concepts. So you can see the 9C sheet there is forming words. The children were really still at this stage thinking about how words are formed, how we put them together, the use of digraphs. But by 19C, we're into different categories, food, not food. This is getting them ready to move on to things like nouns. But we're building it in a gradual progression so that children are learning the basic foundations of language and the different categories that we're going to have. And even with the heading categories, getting the children to understand that they don't really need to know, but it just means groups, that often we have sophisticated words, fairly simple concepts. And it is really that conceptual foundation that we want to develop with the children. So the D, D sheets. Do you want me to go for them? The D sheets, you can see here, we're actually getting the children to start writing for the first time. In later, in the next set of readers, they'll be writing stories. But at this point, we're just getting them to think about a picture and write something simple about it. So you get quite varied answers, but you might get the girl will swim in the pool or the girl likes to swim. And then we get them also thinking about games like pre-crossword, how we put words together. And we, we like them to have games and puzzles with words because that will really engage many students and keep them interested in what they're doing. Hmm. And something like a crossword is using their skills for the real world. So beyond, beyond school, people love word games. And so this is getting them to, to see that they're learning for a purpose, for, for either information or pleasure. And we give them words like rows and columns too. So when we're looking yeah. at these, those crosswords or word finds, word searches, we're talking to them think about things like rows and columns. We're developing their vocabulary at all times. And for the word find, it's a game. The children love it, but it's also another great chance to practice. So when before they do it, we always get them to read out the words because mm. we're not finding it as a block that's just this abstract block. We're reading roof, roof and then we're finding roof. So they're practicing their knowledge and then finding it. Some kids are really clever. They can find the words, but they, if they're not made to read them, they won't even think about the sounds. They'll just do it almost like a picture. We want them always practicing the knowledge they've learned. And you can see down the bottom on 
the 9e page, we have what we call a chasey game, chasing with words, getting the children used to different fonts. So if they pick up a different picture book, they're not going to be scared that the letters are formed slightly differently. Hmm. And you will notice that up in the words search, the words that we're using are reinforcing the words of the reading book, the, the words that they needed to know. So they're not just any words, they're the words of the reading books. Yes, so we should say our system, it remains the same, but everything in the system, every single sheet is reinforcing the knowledge that they need. So this is where we get on to the, for the younger ones, just drawing. Some children love to learn in different ways. Some children are more keen on art. Some are more keen on singing. We're always trying to give them the practice in as many different ways as we can. So here on 9G, they're just writing I, my, pup, pup, and then they're drawing it. The roof, roof the roof, and then they're drawing it. By 19, we're still giving that because some kids love to draw, but we're also then moving on and choosing a picture and writing about it in the exercise book, or we've also got some story prompts. Now, for this, we're writing really for the first time with the children a story. So we actually just do it as a paragraph. And this is where we start thinking with the children about planning. We're going to write about one of these pictures or we're going to write one of the story prompts like the robot. So what are we doing? Oh, we're going to write a paragraph. A paragraph is not just a group of words, but it's a group of sentences that go together. Okay. So while each sentence should be well written and interesting, they also have to be, they have to form a coherent whole. They have to work together. And this is getting the children to plan in sometimes in their mind, sometimes we do it on paper, but just getting them to think of what they're going to say about each of these. So for example, the robot you might say, okay, well, you, what do you know about robots? And they'll tell you and you say, okay, we're going to try to put that together in a coherent whole. And it could be a robot from a movie. It could be a robot from a story. It could be one they're making up, but yeah, you might say, okay, where's this robot? Oh, I was in the park. So oh, I met the robot in the park. You know, and then we're getting them to think, well, okay, what follows on from that? The robot was, what well, was it? Scary, friendly? What did you do? And just trying to get the children to think that this has to be a complete piece that a reader can take and engage with. Hmm. I think you have to be very careful. I was working in a classroom with about this age, the 19, um, level 19 reading book, and a little girl wrote, was writing a story about, she called it a long trip. But the thing is, nothing, she said she went in a car to the beach, and that was about all we got. And so getting them to think when they're, and this is important for examinations later on, if you have a topic, you need to write to the topic, when Nick said the robot went to the park, you need to be careful then that you didn't get a story about parks rather than robots. So just getting the children to think about a key sentence and then other sentences that support that. Um, <laughs> that's sometimes not easy. And we're going to do writing exercises in a couple. But of as a basic starting point for this one, we often might put just robot in a circle and then just do a few spokes or lines coming out from the circle and each of them is something they're going to say about the robot so when they come to write they've got their five or six ideas coming out of that and we can see that they're all about the robot so it doesn't get sidetracked by playing in the park or at the beach hmm. Now, what we wanted to show you here is that there are answer books to uh, for all the levels. Um, I mean, probably you don't need them for word school ones, but some people where English is a very foreign language do like answer books for one. So they will give you uh, answers for anything that you need to, to, to know. Now, we should. So 
we're just going back to the F page. This is a good example of this, but the and it also shows the limitation of the answer book. So question one, who owned the car? I often get the children to use answers using the text. So who owned the car? Mark owned the car. But that's not the only way we can give the answer. We could also say the car belonged to Mark. So the answer book will give you one possible answer, but for the children, we want them to understand that English is an amazing language. It's very varied and very rich, but answers can be written in many different ways. And in tomorrow's session, we'll be talking about um, an aspect called common English usage, which is training the children to see that there's just not one correct way because children often, once they go to commit themselves to writing, think that there has to be a perfectly um, just one way of saying it, but getting them to realise there are many ways of making the same point. So that's um, that. And then we also will always develop with the children. So what colour was the dust on Mars? The dust on Mars was red and we start introducing concepts like pronouns it was red. So we're getting them to think of how to form the answer, but in multiple different ways. When we go on to these ones, again, we're working on language conventions, grammar, punctuation, spelling, and it should all be formed, like the sentences there, into how we can use English in a meaningful way and how we can engage with it, how we can explain it to someone who doesn't. So food, not food, the children get to put them into their categories, but we can also use that to prompt them to write something about maybe which food do they like or thinking of the other words, why is it not a food? What can you do with a hammer? Ah, oh, no, you use a hammer to hit things. So we're always trying to put things into meaningful constructions that the children are able to then take away and use in different situations. Now, we just thought that in summary, we, we'd actually go back just to show you again how the method remains the same because that's that's really, really important in using our method. So uh, well, first of all, that it's um, a decodable, the books are decodable, which means that they are uh, read according to phonic rules and, and that the method remains the same. So they're the important things really for tonight. So with the A sheets, we're looking at the new sounds and that's the front, of, that's a picture of the front of the Word Skills book. With, and, and that's the front of the Word School book. That's, that's going on to the next set of reading books. So the method remains the same. We've got the A sheets teaching the new sound. No, we've got now so again we get the reader, we've got the new sound, and we've got the special words. And I did say this, I should say it again. When we see the special words like name, we always teach the rule. What we've found is the children love this. They learn a rule like A, another letter E. The E makes the A say A, and they learn it a simple way with one word. But when they then come to practice it in a reader, where they have one reader practicing that particular rule, they already feel empowered. Right from the start, they can often tell the teacher what that rule is. He said, but you haven't had a book on this. And they go, oh, no, but we learned it in name. Hmm. And then they can build upon that knowledge. Hmm. And having knowledge that they can build upon really not only empowers them, but it engages them with the learning and consolidates what they've learned. So multiple practices on each thing. Hmm. All those words appearing there, we would call not so special. Actually, there's special words like what. Nick, we spoke about what before, W-H-A-T. It's, it's a special word. You simply have to learn it. But these, all the four words there, we'll have a reader devoted to them a little bit further on. Um, Nick's talking about the A, another letter, then an E. All the vowels are the same. I, another letter, then an E. The E makes the I say I. English words... Um, words that are actually English, not like spaghetti or ski, you cannot end an English word in I. So I is um, called, Y is called a substitute vowel. I say, <laughs> I like fancy dress. It dresses up as a Y. And a, as we know, A-Y is a, is a digraph. But just looking at, at um, this is reader nine, but when we look here, 
at reader 19, you can see in the word space, once more, we re we're visit revisiting A and another letter, then an E. So we keep consolidating that knowledge until a book becomes devoted to it, and then it will no longer be called a special word because a, a, a reading book has been devoted to it. So that's, that's the... Um, the back of the books and now here just revising again that the B sheets teach the special words. They're words that have not appeared yet in any of the um, earlier readers. So that's getting practice of them there. And they're also revising like said would be reader eight, go would be reader eight, play we've um, learned in reader, uh, that is reader nine there. Uh, and the but other, the yeah. rule like a y is what they learn in reader 20 a y making the sound a but mm -hmm. they've already learned a couple of words so here when they get to reader 20 they're more able to access it mm -hmm. and so the b sheets are bringing in the special words and that's really what we wanted to say there and and always the text supports the uh, abstract knowledge that they've learned so we're not teaching them just ooh or art for just because we think it's important for them to learn, which of course it is, but so that they can read a book. So and on on these ones, when we're reading reader nine with the younger kids, we're always sounding it out. D ad dad soon get skets yap yap. We're sounding it out. By the time we get to reader nineteen, for some kids, they're able to move beyond that. Not all are. So we say to the kids, okay, let's try to read it. Some words like they, we've learned as a special word, you can never sound it out. But got, got, two, special word, da, special word, park, park. But if they're able to read it, they might say when they got to the park, park. And they're just using the sounding for words they're not as familiar with, possibly because it has the new rule. So they sound it out. So we're trying to move between these two from always sounding into reading and sounding where we need to. Hmm. You can see reader nine, that's a wonderful example of a decodable reader because every word is decodable. Nick read a little bit of it, do add, do, dad. We, we have the children, this is something we should have been saying, we, we have the children sounding it out. Some of them by this stage simply could read. Dad soon gets yap from the roof. Yap sits in my room. Now, why, if they can read it like that, would we get them to sound it out? Well, we get them to sound it out because of spelling. Any, anything that a child reads in our reader, um, a child should be able to write back. So we're trying to keep reading and writing together. With some systems, children can learn to read, but they don't learn to write. So we're trying to build writing con confidence. So the whole thing there, do add, do dad, soon, go et, get, you app, yap, for from the roof. And so you can see how English really is a phonic language and therefore you can decode in that way. Now, I think that might be, Nick, is that all we wanted to say tonight? I think. I think we've actually got through in about an hour instead of. I think so we thought more... it was an hour to start with. <laughs> so that's, that's what we were working at. But. Um, which is quite good because I think I saw someone raise their hand. So maybe we've got more time for questions tonight, which might be, be good. Mm. So, so are we. Uh, yeah, you could click on Nisha. Oh, yeah. So do I, do I just do this? You click on here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So here. On the view. On the, on, on on the, the view. view. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, someone's yeah. raising their hand. I'm not quite sure. I thought I clicked on we might my hand. Need to pause or stop. Yeah. Um, uh, that's Mish Nisha who's raising your hand. Do you want to ask something or is it just by? Yes, Nisha. You need to unmute, Nisha. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Is, is everything? Yes, just mute. No? I have yeah. enabled the chat. Yeah. Uh, uh, the floor is open for the chat. Everyone, please put in your questions. Uh, before that, I would just like to um, give a little time to some of us children who are reading these readers beautifully. 
Uh, Pew, sir, can you please share the video? Sure. Uh, give me a moment. I will just. That's wonderful, wonderful. So he is Kabir from Nagar International School. He just turned five. That's and amazing. And how beautiful he's reading. Yeah, he is. So this is we... Faye and Nick. This is a token of thanks to you from the complete, uh, you know, Fitzroy readers community here in India. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this, actually. And yes. I also have Miss Montu. Who from uh, Ms. Motu Malotra from um, Batnagar International School, Basantpuj. Uh, she would just like to share her experience with uh, Faye and Nick and wants to share about how Fitzroy readers have accelerated reading among her students in the, in the school, actually. So if we can give a spotlight to Ms. Montu and she can share her experience. Hello, very good evening. To all present here, and uh, I am very thankful uh, that I've been given this opportunity to be able to express my views since we've started using the Fitzroy reading program. And I'm grateful to Shifali Janeja and the SAR uh, Publication House for having introduced these books to us. And uh, I begin by extending my deep gratitude to Faye and Nick for uh, conducting this enlightening and enriching workshop today. And largely my gratitude goes towards you to have brought about uh, giving us this reading program. And I can uh, really imagine the way you were taking us through the workshop that uh, your relentless and uh, your dedicated efforts, you know, have helped us to have this program and we are able to use it. I can imagine that how many years of research and determined efforts must have gone into bringing about a series of books which promote gradual, structured, and uh, uh, you know a very gradual and structured progression of reading in children. And I must say that I have personally experienced the impactful and the impressive change that it has brought about uh, in, and the, in the reading powers of our children. And how, since we have adapted and taken your books into our curriculum over the past few years, and we have also seen how children have integrated the art of reading into their customary way of life and have started enjoying reading and they're reaping benefits from your reading program. And I wish we would have been introduced to the phonic way of reading earlier, but nevertheless, I must say that I'm glad that we know of it now and we are able to use it. As a result, we today have happy readers instead of struggling readers. So after the introduction of the sounds and uh, clubbed with the Fitzroy readers, I have seen tremendous and visible 
changes in the children, augmenting their vocabulary in the process of using these books as well. Their mm -hmm. comprehension level has increased many fold. Also, I have seen that the fear for taking dictations has completely vanished because now they are able to decode words into sounds and they're able to spell words easily. So uh, we have willing readers in a classroom. We have willing readers. Mostly everybody is able to read with ease. So the percentage of good readers has gone up significantly. We have seen the convincing and the impressive changes. We have also seen that the teachers are able to understand the logic behind taking up this reading program. And they're able to give out reasons to the children to, as to why some words are read the way they are with the use of diagrams. Reading has tremendously become easier. Also, the Fitzroy resources, the, especially namely the Fitzroy Teacher's Guide, has uh, immensely helped our teachers and with the expert tips there. Overall, I would like to say that the entire program, which you just took us through, with the, you know, taking us through, uh, taking the children through the words that they already know, the special sounds, then the word skill books that teach them, uh, take them through different kind of exercises, covering the creative writing, the comprehension, the spelling, the grammar. So the entire program is a very well-rounded program with a very systematic approach. So I truly thank you, Faye and Nick, today. And I hope that uh, we can have many more workshops uh, like today's enlightening one and enriching us all to take the cause of reading further. And since English is a second language to many a children in our country, it has truly, truly help them. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'd just like to respond. You, you said a couple of things that really warmed my heart. You spoke about the joy of reading. And I think that's so important to give the children a method that they can understand what they're doing. And so this is what we were saying about non-decodable readers. They can panic. But here is something like that. It's something they can read for themselves and they, the empowerment that that gives them and it encourages them to go on to the next book. And so it's not so long before they become quite fluent, like that little child who was reading uh, a Bug on a Rug, which was, was absolutely lovely. And absolutely. You, and, and, and as you said, the, the children have confidence and the teachers, because the method remains the same, it is accessible to the, both the students and to the teachers, and that, that makes us happy. Here in Australia, um, our Aboriginal community use our books quite a lot because maybe you don't realise this, but English is not their first language. In fact, they have 500 languages, very, very mixed, um, so many languages, but and with no English spoken at home for a lot of them, they find that this is, is a wonderful method because they they feel empowered. We, um, in fact, we went, one of the best days of my life was we were invited, and this is quite a, not a, a nice story, I suppose, to a high security jail for teenagers where many of the children were, in fact, um, Aboriginal children. And they were so excited because they said to me, they, they had our reading method there and they were working with it beautifully. And the, the uh, Aboriginal, they're adolescent children. They came and they were reading a fat cat and a big pig, but they said, oh, now we know how English works. And that was just so wonderful for them because of course, if we can educate these people, they have a chance in life. But anyway, thank you very much for that. Maybe we have other questions. Um, I'll just add on that. I taught in Taiwan for many years, so I've seen the impact it can have on second languages. Mm. The the Probably the biggest thing I'd say that we should repeat always is we want the children to have the sounding out, that decoding as their default method. I don't know. I use the analogy with adults of driving a car. Now, I remember learning to drive and putting the car into first and the clutch in and 
I think about my driving. It was really hard. Now I drive across Melbourne and I haven't actually thought about what I'm doing. I'm just driving automatically. We want the children to sound out as much as they can at the start. So when they come on a, come to a word they don't know, sounding it out, looking for the sounds, looking for those rules is their default position. Mm. And when I did my master's, that was something I, some psychological terms I hadn't had. I sort of always, that's how I'm aware that I'm using phonics because I'm, every time I see a word that I'm not as familiar with, that's what I'm doing. And that's what we're hoping the children will always be doing. Mm. So there, I'm sure there are lots of other questions, but thank you very much for your thank thank you for your thanks and for your comments. Mm. Thank, you. thank you, Ms. Malotra, for sharing your insight. And, and I think you rightly mentioned that these readers are meticulously planned. And if you know these readers cover a critical component of literacy, which is your phonemic awareness, your systematic phonics, fluency, vocabulary development, and comprehension, which is the science of reading, actually. And we could see how Kabir started to decode words and he you know eventually started to you know automatically start reading and that you know it became so automatic that he started to come out straight away with the words and that's what yeah. we are all achieving with these readers actually so uh, thank you so much we have a few questions which were already asked uh, you know in the form that we had shared uh, one of the questions that normally you know people ask is should we do letter sounds and the letter names just simultaneously or is that is that one step ahead of, or back how do you how do you suggest we don't we do them at the same time but the most important knowledge is the sound so if the children don't know the name but they know the sound that's fine if they know the name, but they don't know the sound, that's not so good. But we do this with lots of little stories. So when we're saying, oh, look, this is an animal, we might hold a picture of a cat. And we say, oh, well, okay, it's a cat, but what sound does it make? Meow. Okay, so cats say meow. Good. Uh, this is the letter C. What sound does it make? It makes the sound K. So we give them like an animal a dog says woof, but you know, show them a letter. This is a Y. It says Y. Yeah. So we're always getting them to think, okay, we have a name, like a name for an animal, but the animal has a sound. The letter has a name. It also has a sound. Well, one of the games I play is I say, oh, okay, let's sing the names of the, the letters. We've got like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But I, I, instead of singing the names of the letters, I sing the names of the members of the class. I might sing... Um, Alice, Romany, Omen, and, and then, oh no, that was your names, wasn't it? No, 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 now the names of the letters. But then one of the games we play, this is at an earlier level than we showed tonight, is good breaks game. So that we're singing the names of the, the, um, the names of the alphabet letters, but then we stop on a letter and that's that they have to have their breaks going. They can't, they can't go past. And that gives them a focus. So then, okay, so that's our letter for today. And you might have different prompts. So you say you're doing um v for vase. Well, you you might have a violin and a vase and our classic Australian spread Vegemite and a few things like that. So, okay, so what sound do you think it makes? And, you know, we get like that. And so then we, we go to the alphabet book and we learn to write it. But it is very important. We do sing the alphabet song, but I get them to say, okay, but what what's important? The sound, because sounds, words are sounds put together. That's the intellectual understanding they need to know. Words are sounds put together. And that's where good ears games are very good. Um, um, you know, r -u -f -r -u -um, this sort of thing. Words are sounds put together. And the alphabet song, which everyone knows, I often get the children to sing by doing the sounds instead. So instead of saying A, B, C, we go A, B, K, D, F, G, H, I, J, K. And it's quite a challenge for them because they all know the alphabet song, but they've never thought of doing it with the sounds. But as they're developing them, they think it's quite funny to do that but it's always coming to, back to that sounds are important. So if there's one thing you learn, it's the sound. If you can learn the sound and the name, that's even better. But the sound is the primary focus. Hmm.
All right, thank you so much. This is really interesting. The same in classrooms. Another another question that one of the audience had was the shift from the decodable text to the non-decodable text. How do we manage that? You know, and you know, uh, by grade three or by grade four or by grade five, what is the right time to shift from there? So. English to me is always decodable. That's the strange thing because not, I mean, English has over a million words, nine, more than around 950,000 of them are phonic. So English really is always going to be decodable. The problem comes more when children don't have the knowledge that they need. Mm. Now, what I loved I, this is teaching five-year-olds in Taiwan when they ran up to me with actually the reader, why we had the three little pigs. They ran up to me and said, the three little pigs. Oh, we know that TH, TH says, and you know, th. And I, what? And they, I hadn't taught them TH said th, but they knew it was the three little pigs. They went out and worked out that that word must be th-re-e. Hmm. So we have the children right from the start saying, you're detectives. Hmm. You can find rules. We might not have taught you a rule, but if you've got a book that you know, you can actually find rules and discover them for yourselves. And then when they go to readers, so for our children, we're first language mostly. We do have a number of second language children who've immigrated to Australia, but we're always trying, right, once they've finished the first set or two, maybe 19, we're saying, okay, now you should be looking for books yourself. You won't be able to read every rule every word you might need to ask your parents or ask for a rule if you get stuck but have a go you can often work out from the context also what that word is so we're having them really try to be detectives and discover things hmm. i'd just like to add there as nick said english is a decodable language i agree about 95 percent of it is anyway but only if you learn 50 other words like for example what there are 50 words that you simply have to learn. But if you learn those 50 words like who, for example, who, um, or the, yeah, or um, what's another was, yeah. were. So we often give an example of a sentence like the cat was on the mat. And you go, okay, the special word was special word. The again, special word. And they might say, well, English is half w words that you can't sound out. We say, well, yes, but it is those very, very common 50. And if anyone did our training last time, we actually went through that. And the special words in the readers very quickly incorporate all of the 50 very common words like was, were, have, the. So the children are able to use those 50 words that recur again and again, very fluently. So it's the 50 words plus the diagraphs, plus the alphabet sound. So that's 26 plus 50, 50 76 50. plus the 60 rules. So it's really 136 bits of abstract knowledge that gives you access to 95% of the English language. Hmm. We, we did have a chart. We might put that on for tomorrow. Perhaps some of you are coming back tomorrow. If you are, it would might be useful to have that up just to show you what we're talking about if you see a picture of something it's often easier to remember it that way and that explains why we have the special words like name where they're not so special because there's a rule but we have the special words like the of two that are going to occur again and again and that's why we have them in the readers as special words because it's part of that real core knowledge of 50 special words that just occur again and again hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we can we can we can show them the fifty words tomorrow in the webinar, and also for everyone's uh, benefit, please be present tomorrow also, as we will be covering the second part of the uh, the session tomorrow, which would be readers from twenty one to sixty readers with a focus on the writing skills too. So I request each one of you to be present tomorrow because this webinar we had planned for two days, half an hour on each day. So uh, participants who are present for both the days will be awarded the certificate of participation. Um, I thank each one of you uh, to be present here on behalf of Team SAR. I want to extend my sincere gratitude for attending the webinar. We are thrilled to see so much, a huge audience join for the event. We were 1,000 
participants today throughout the session and another 1000 watching us live on youtube so for those of you who already who missed this webinar it's going to be on the youtube for for you to you know watch later if you missed something please watch this webinar again uh, your presence made the webinar truly special uh, this for fay and for nick your presence have really made, made this uh, uh, event fruitful people have understood the progression they understood how it's a complete literacy program uh, thank you so much everyone uh, uh, let's be present tomorrow at the same time see you tomorrow thank you so much we're happy if like at, we've got Afshan with a question. We're happy to answer a few more questions if that helps. Uh, do we have any more questions? I mean, we, uh, everybody can put hand raise at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Afshan, you have a hand raised. How do we go? <laughs> Afshan, you you raised your hand. You want to ask something? Uh, hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you so much, Chef Ali, for the interested session. And just a question. I just want to have the link for YouTube as I didn't attend first 10 minutes. So I missed that part. It would be very kind if you share the link for the same. So sure, sure. we'll post the link in the chat box. Um, Mr. Piyush, can you please uh, post the, I mean, uh, put the link in the chat box, please, for everyone's benefit. Thank you Tanya, so much. Sure. Tanya, do you have a question? Uh, can you please yeah. clear the sound, uh, confusion of sound, letter sound, uh, for the letter A, E, and I? So, That's what our children get more, more, most confused in. A, E, so, and I, which is... Yeah, so A is an A. And we often do with the children the mouth shape. So A is making the A, E says E, I says E. So we often get the children with the vowels going A, E, E, O, A. A, E, E, O, A. So they have five distinct sounds. And if you travel around the world, we always laugh at, in Australia, we have to say we sometimes um, laugh at the New Zealanders because we think they sort of squash all their vowel sounds together, but we try to always keep it as at, at, it, or, ah. Hmm. At, apple, at, like in bed, yeah. egg, at, for egg, it, for igloo, yes. op, for on, orange, up, for umbrella, up. Hmm. I think... We call them the short vowels, and I think English might be the only language that has the short vowels. Um, I have a French daughter-in-law, and she simply cannot say um, catch. She says, she always says cut, a cut. She gives it a U sound because she cannot say a. Ah. But her children, who are now bilingual, they can go a, e, e, o, a quite readily. And um, because we didn't... Last time we spoke about the earlier books, but the first five of the reading books, that's one to five and one X to five X, deal with the, what we call the short vowels. Like that wonderful book that was shown to us this evening uh, about the bug on a rug, that's a, a, e, o, a. That's the fifth, that's the but, U, the letter U. Yeah. So... Yeah, the, the five vowel sounds, they're the five, first five readers and reader six re practices all five. But that is our primary focus at the start because every English letter, every English word will have a vowel in it. In fact, every English syllable has a vowel in it. So we really need those vowels. And they're the first five books in both X and the, the straight one to five. Hmm. Thank you. There's another one question, though you've covered it, I think uh, she must have missed it. Uh, what she's uh, Pooja asked us that, could you please tell us the sequence of how we should take story and worksheets together? Are we supposed to complete the full story first or it goes hand in hand? So this normally when we do the worksheets, it's the A sheet, the B sheet, read the reader, we do the comprehension. And then for the other sheets, we don't stress on the order. So sometimes we like to do the C and D sheets, the grammar and punctuation. Sometimes it depends on time, 
but the story is usually one of the ones. So after the reader, that story we're reading, when we're writing a story, that is usually one of the ones we do as the last activity for each unit. Mm, that's right. Yes. Yes. But certainly we think it's important to do the A and the B sheets first, because then you get the new words that you're going to be using in the book and the sound, which is at usually a diagraph that you're going to, you may not have met before. Is that answering the question clearly? I think. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Certainly, I think uh, to reiterate what you said, sheet number A, sheet B, read the story. And uh, usually after the story, we do comprehension worksheet, which is F, and then the others can be done at, at our own uh, leisure uh, and also depending on the time that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, am I right? Going, yes, and if I'm writing a story with the class, sometimes, sometimes for the kids as they get older, they want to write quite intricate stories so we might want two classes for that so if it's on a friday i'll say okay we'll do the grammar page today because i want to give you monday and tuesday where it's fresher in your mind if we leave it over the weekend they often forget what they're going to write mm. hopefully mm -hmm. if we get them planning well and in the writing workshops we'll talk about planning they have something to prompt and remind them but story writing is a very important part of it. So we want to make sure that when we come to writing stories, they do have sufficient time to do it well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And, uh, uh, and the soft and the beautiful. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was gonna say we've had a few hands up. Tanya's had a hand up for a while. So if she's got a question with yeah, yeah, Tanya. And then you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, I just have a simple question. It's easy for us to take out uh, phonics to uh, with the children, small kids. It's easier for us. But when it comes to the age group of 10 to 15, those the ones who have not gone ahead uh, with the phonics in their child, you know, in their uh, younger age. So how can we take ahead these things and how can we teach them? Because it's this... They've just crossed the age, they crossed the certain, uh, you know, uh, time of their lives when they had to learn phonics. And now coming to grades three, four, five and six, and how do we go ahead with the phonics then? Uh, so I've often tutored children. I've done quite a bit of work with children who have had serious reading difficulties and come to us from other schools outside school. Often I actually say to them, well, and you show them the earlier readers and they think, oh, that's sort of like baby's work. And I say, yeah, but it has knowledge you need. And if I think the kid can do it, I say, I'm going to do, we're going to do one year's work in a day. And we'll actually go through the whole first set of readers, but really getting them to think about the sounds. For other kids, I might say, okay, let's look at the you know, reader. If we, you're 10, we might be reading reader 50 or reader 45. But when we go through the words we know, we do them just the words we know page sounding it out. So e p keep, Oh, what's the rule? E, e says E you might have earth. Ah, oh, we've got two rules there. Do you know what they are? E a R when it's got letters after it says, er, T H says th. So we've got er, th. And so we'll use that words. We know page because that will give them in after a, if they go through a set of 10 readers, they will have definitely had a word that's practiced each of the rules they've learned previously. So they're not having to go back, but by using those pages, we can do it. I often set children a challenge too. They're going to read a book. Hopefully they're reading. doesn't matter. It can be Harry Potter. It can be any, any book, but I say, okay, for the first page or the first paragraph, I want you to find as many rules as you can. Just write them down. A-R-O-O-E-A-R-C-H. And just so that you're priming their brains when they're reading to look for the rules. Mm. And I've said that with parents, maybe get that if you're reading with your kid, just for the first five minutes, have them read to you and tell you all the rules and then just go ahead, read as much as you want. But by having them think for the first couple of minutes about the rules and look for them, you mm. prime their brain to be focusing on that as they read on. Mm. It certainly is a bit of a challenge. I know we we have quite a few children in our school here who have come to us because they have had learning spelling difficulties and just trying to refocus them. I, I understand that question. They simply almost refuse to look at the word and see the sound within the word. 
but it really is a matter of teaching them to do that. And, and Nick has explained a really good technique for that. And we do spelling tests and dictation, but the spelling lists. So if they don't want to read the whole reader, but you can just say, oh, okay, have a look at this spelling list. And you give them the AR list and the AY list. And so I'm just going to test you on a few of them. And every day you might just give them three words like play, say, may, but they have to, if they don't know the AY rule, oh, why don't you? Okay, let's look at the rule. We'll go back. We'll help you with this one. Now try it. And once they've learned AY is A, and then they're able to write the words they need, that becomes a bit more automatic. But it is always trying to make it that automatic process. And if they haven't done it from the start, it can be quite hard. Mm. I've got one little boy who insists on writing like the shun, which is the uh, Latin, T-I-O-N. He, he keeps writing it S-H-N, S-H-N. And, you know, I keep saying it's wonderful. Yeah, that is right from sound, but we're using, you know, T-I-O-N. I think last week we managed to get T-I-O-N and I felt so happy. But it, it is, it's about reprogramming, I think, so that they look at it from a different point of view. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We've got lovely responses. Um, everybody's thanking. Everybody's saying lovely session. So we've got a lot of compliments for for both of you for the session. Um, thank you so Actually, much. We do have Anju. If Anju wants to ask something, one last yeah. question for Anju. She's been raising her hand. So one last question we can take. Good evening, ma'am. Mum, I have one doubt that which is worksheet of the book and uh, there are many questions. Uh, the, are the students are able to read the questions? Can they read up to even the student is of kindergarten? How they can read the questions like um, what did Tom care to do? Gym rat means how we can say the capacity have of student for reading this type of the question in worksheet. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. On the word skills for the earlier ones, it does say the teacher may need to read the question to the students. So for the earlier ones, the teacher will off, will will always assist the students as they need it to read the questions. As they get onto the higher levels, we're expecting the students to be able to read the questions mm. themselves. But for the first few sets, the teacher is definitely reading it to the students. Mm. But when I'm reading it to them, I read it with them and we're looking at it and they're following along with the words. So they're actually getting us helping them, but they're paying attention. So hopefully in the future, it's more accessible. And they're starting to notice some of the question words like what and how, when, why, why, you know, and after reader 23, they've heard WH says what they've also learned in reader 13 that the Y at the end in a one syllable word says I, so they can read Y from the knowledge, but in the first sets, of course, they can't do that. Yeah. It is really important as soon as you can to get them to read, read it for themselves. I agree with Nick. We always get them to follow along as we read in the first books, but as we know, so much depends on reading instructions clearly that getting them to read, learning to read and pay attention, sometimes looking at the word schools, once they know what they're doing, they, they can actually guess what they're meant to do without reading the question. But we always make them go back and read it, often in a big class, as a class together, but making sure and then picking out one or two to reread to make sure they are reading it accurately because so much now in our modern world depends on reading with accuracy. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we're all uh, set. Uh, with your permission, Faye and Nick, can we call it a day? Yes. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, sorry for anyone. We didn't answer questions. Hopefully you're there tomorrow and we'll get a chance to answer them then. Hmm. Yes, certainly. Thank you so much for being so modest. Thank you so much for answering uh, so many questions today. Thank you, audience. We, we hope to see you tomorrow at the same time for the same show. Thank you so much with the same presenters. Uh, all right. Bye-bye.